Felix. Uh, I'm based in San Francisco. Some of you might remember, we used to have a CEO who said things like, open source is communism, why would anybody ever do that? Um, so it took a whole bunch of time, including a new CEO, to move over to a time where we can uh, fully embrace open source and do more open source things than we used to. Um, and we now found a new team, which is the open source engineering team. Uh, quick summary what we do. Um, we're essentially around 60 engineers now, uh, which is kind of mind-blowing because we hired 55 people in just the last year. Um, when I joined the team, we were like three people. Um, and it's sort of an engineering team without any kind of goals, no product to maintain, no backlog to support, and we have not a single PM, which um, if any of you know Microsoft World, it's fantastic because we don't really have anyone telling us what to do. So our main mission is that we essentially go on GitHub, uh, sort by stars, and try to find all the stuff that currently doesn't integrate well with the Microsoft World. It is essentially evangelism turned around. What we used to do as Microsoft for the longest time is that we built something, then went out there and told everyone that this is the very best, and you should go and use this, and only this, and please nothing else. Um, and what we're now increasingly trying to do is, uh, and that, by the way, also explains the Mac, why my team is based on Macs, is that we go out there, and it turns out that companies, not my, you know, companies that aren't Microsoft have every now and then built something good. <laughs> Surprise. And um, we try to make sure that those things play well with Microsoft technologies. So what I want to do today is give you a very quick overview of what we do with open source, what open source looks like at Microsoft, what kind of uh, changes that brings into actual product, um, and then very quickly, I know this took forever to set up, but then very quickly, um, I want to jump over into Q&A and just see if any of you have any questions about what we're doing in engineering, because we're going increasingly open, um, and uh, I can essentially very, you know, very candidly and very frankly speak about what's going on inside engineering, if you have any questions about anything. Um, so without further ado, uh, let's briefly recap all the things that have happened. Um, we are now at a point where we have 1,100 projects open sourced. It is basically a new one every single day. More and more documentation is moving to GitHub. Um, and that really allows people to not only look at our source code, but also to actually collaborate with us. And I think that's, that's what is really, really exciting. Um, something GitHub keeps mentioning, um, and we had a GitHub conference about three weeks ago, is from the moment we open source.net, at least the core CLR took about 70 hours until somebody came by and was like, surprise, I ported this thing over to Mac OS X. It wasn't actually a bunch of Microsoft engineers that did that. It was really someone outside who was just like, you guys have Civilite running on, on Mac OS X. I'm pretty sure I can make this run on Mac OS X. Uh, so that took about 70 hours. And ever since we open sourced it, just in the first four weeks, we received more code contributions than in the existence of .NET before. And I'm not talking about like outside code contributions, but like commits all up. So just to like make a giant banner around this comment once again, since the inception of .NET until the moment we open sourced it, we, got, we had less commits than from the moment we open sourced it on in the next four weeks which is kind of mind-blowing, just if you think about the amount of code churn and how many things we can do. Uh, the, the obvious downside is, I don't know, is anyone in the room who tried to contribute to the .NET Core, Core CLR, Roslyn, anything? No? Uh, you should. It's a lot of fun. I can heavily recommend it. Uh, I'm going to make a case for that later, but um, the obvious downside is that we were, at least in the first couple of weeks, absolutely drowning in um, pull requests, and it was sort of hard to respond to all of them, but um, it's nevertheless kind of fantastic. So the bottom line here is that we're open sourcing more and more stuff. Um, many pieces of Azure are open sourced today. Um, some of you might know if you want to run Azure web apps at home, you totally can. You get the same portal, same deployment tools. Pretty much everything that is on Azure that doesn't require super custom hardware or our um, dearly loved DevOps team, you can sort of run at home. Um, the idea is that we think we run Azure very well, but if you think you want to try the whole thing for yourself and not install one of those Windows Server machines, you can just pull, pull the code and run it wherever you feel like. Um, so the whole point here is, and that is, that is one that I make both inside the company as well as outside the company over and over again together with my team, is um, that open source really is not a release channel. It is not about, I work in secret for about a year and then, ta-da, here's my code. Um, and then somebody can do whatever with it, whatever that is supposed to be. It is really much more about collaboration that we do across industry and across companies. And I have a few, a few examples of those just to display um, how we're trying to work with other companies and how that really accelerates the way we can move forward as an industry. Because most of the coders today are not really, not really focusing on whatever the company is trying to do, um, which, if you think about it, is sort of crazy, right? So, for instance, inside 
the Visual Studio team, we have a bunch of people working on stuff that is not making a great IDE, it is just making it possible to build a great IDE. It would be fantastic if we could, more could, if we could move more people from point A to point B so they can focus on the actual product. Um, and that, that is really what we tried to do. So um, I know you talked about the Surface Book um, a few seconds ago, and just quickly explaining why my team is here, why we're here. Uh, number one, Australia is great. It's obviously a great location to go to, right? It's a lot of fun. You guys have great beaches. I certainly have never been here before, so that's pretty exciting. But the second thing is, does anybody know Drawboard? It's very, very sad. It's a great PDF annotation app and reader, which is pre-installed on all Surface devices. Uh, we, we, in fact, bought a lot of those apps, like a lot of them, enough of them to pre-install them on all Surface devices. And um, as you may or may not know, we currently have a bunch of new Surface devices in the pipeline, right? You have seen some of them. Um, and Drawbot itself as an application has a few ideas on what they want to do in the future. We have a few ideas on what they could do in the future. We have a few new devices coming out. There's a lot of excitement going on. Uh, especially, we have new devices coming out. Um, that are dramatically bigger than the devices you have today. Things like, you know, multi-touch screens, all bigger and gigantic. Um, and Drawbot is this little startup, uh, and they have a radial menu, which they bought from a third-party provider, which is really horrible. Um, breaks all the time, memory consumption is through the roof, uh, risk usage is just horrible. Um, and they essentially reached out and was like, hey, I know if you're up for helping us out with this, because obviously, you know, we're pre-installed, so maybe you guys want your apps to not crash. That would be fantastic. Um, so the, what we then did, we came by, built this radial menu um, with a goal that if anybody else wants to use a radial menu, it's never going to become part of the default XAML toolbox. It's never going to be something that we ship officially with any project. But we can basically build this together with Drawboard, then put it out there, um, put an MIT license on it, which pretty much means do whatever you want with it, but don't sue us if it breaks for you, but do whatever you want with it, um, in the hope that other developers are then enabled to um, do their own thing. That is obviously a pretty small example, so I'm going to quickly jump over to slightly bigger ones. Um, working with a bunch of other companies, we found that interacting with Azure Blob Storage about half a year ago from platforms that aren't Windows is sort of hard. Um, and that kind of crystallized when we had a meeting with a bunch of Azure people, my team, a bunch, bunch of customers. And um, one of the customers had this great question for the Blob Storage team. It was, how do I rename a file from Mac OS X? And the response was, well, first you install Mono, <laughs> and then you download the DLL, and then you know, eventually you can rename your file, um, which is pretty horrible. So what we did is we used Electron, which is application framework that consumes IOJS, which is a fork of Node.js, um, uses Chromium to basically give you this browser window uh, with Node context in the middle, so you do have access to the file system. Then we took that, took the Azure Node SDK, which is, by the way, totally open source. You can look at it, you can use it, um, combine all those things together to very quickly build a storage explorer that sort of behaves like a storage explorer should behave. You can upload, download files. Um, and in the meantime, learned a lot about building Electron, which sort of brings me to my next point, um, which is Electron. Turns out Electron is running a bunch of things, um, amongst others, GitHub, Slack, Atom, Facebook's new IDE, if anybody ever used that, uh, Visual Studio Code, which is the one we care about a lot. Um, and we're also exploring it for a bunch of other applications that we have. Um, it's, it's very, very powerful. It's um, most popularly, I think, used by both GitHub and Atom, if people, you know, the, those apps are more popular than Visual Studio Code today. Um, but there are certain issues that we have with Electron. So instead of all these little companies going off and working on it by themselves without doing anything dramatic, um, the easiest path for us is to just be like, you know what, guys, let's just all get together into a room and figure this thing out. Right? So uh, a good example is that right after I return from this, um, we have a bunch of people coming in from Switzerland, um, where Visual Studio Code is being built, and we have a bunch of people coming in from GitHub, various other apps. And we just all get into a room and try to make sure that Electron runs really, really well on the next version of Windows, um, as well as the current version of Windows, which is also fairly important. Um, the benefit here being fairly obvious, right? So we all get into a room, we work on this, we work on it once, and everybody can go back and focus on what they're actually trying to do, which in the case of Visual Studio Code is not trying to figure out how a node can effectively talk to Windows native services, but it is to build a great code editor that I do this cross-platform. In the case of Slack, it is to build a fantastic chat application. It also is not to figure out how to ideally focus Windows on Windows. Um, 
So that is sort of the sort of the core idea here. And the interesting part is that we very quickly went full circle here. And um, my my favorite example for that is Hololens, um, which I'm going to paint this full circle of open source and how that really works well for us and super well for us. So there's something called Mono. I don't know if any of you played with it. Has anybody ever? No. Um, two had three hands. Okay. Should be more. Mono is now officially great. Um, so Mono is an open source implementation of .NET and also a C# -sharp compiler that runs cross-platform. It powers Xamarin, which is that cross-platform framework you may have heard of. It also powers Unity 3D, which is today the most popular 3D engine used for games and various other things. Um, by far, Unity 3D is so dominant in the market that it's very hard to ignore it. The cool piece is that all of that is C#. -sharp. Um, so Mono being an open source implementation did not always play super well with Microsoft. Cuff, cuff. Actually, we did not always play super nice with them, right? Because they were sort of giving something away for free that we were trying to pay our bills with. Um, but now that we open source.net, there are two important things that happen. Number one is Mono can just go ahead, look at our code, and use it. Number two is they get to use it because that includes a patent grant, which means they're sort of, it's not just. It's not just the hope that we don't sue them, we actually give them a guarantee that we were not going to sue them because they use those, those things. So Mono um, has now a much easier time to keep up with Rosalind, our current implementation of C-sharp, where C-sharp is going. The language specification is open. .NET is now managed by the .NET Foundation. If anybody wants to call in to the, to the, um, to the essentially the stand-ups that the .NET team has, they're all open, streamed live. You can join, you can tell them what you're going to be working on, if you happen to be working on .NET by any time. Um, but the interesting piece is that Unity is going to be powering HoloLens apps. Um, so we sort of went full circle here because Unity is really today the most effective and easiest way to build really powerful 3D applications. And with HoloLens, the whole 3D aspect is going to become really, really important. Um, and since you can now build Unity applications in Visual Studio, in fact, Visual Studio 2015 Community Edition ships with Unity, um, it is for us really the best way to build HoloLens apps. Um, so we sort of went full way where um, if you build a HoloLens application today, which you can do, you don't need to have one right now. You can just build a HoloLens app in Unity today. Essentially, any given UWP app that runs Unity is going to run on HoloLens. In addition to all the other UWP apps, but specifically if you want to do cool 3D stuff and you want to have zombies running around and like aliens on the wall, um, you probably want to do that in Unity because 3D XAML is fairly hard and difficult and unnecessary hard. Um, we sort of went full circle, right? Where if you do compile a HoloLens application, you run it through Cecile first, which is a mono compiler, and then all that stuff is being handed over to Roslyn, which compiles it again, but you have both those compilers working together really neatly and really effectively, um, which, is, which is sort of fantastic. So in addition to that, we started opening up virtually everything we have to other platforms. And I think we're doing that in a pace that is fairly impressive, and I'm sort of amazed how effectively that is going today. Um, it, it's always difficult to talk to uh, meetups that are fairly diverse, and I would still say that .NET is super diverse, right? Because uh, I talk to .NET game developers all the time, which tend to do other things than your typical .NET financial sector an analyst. Um, but we have opened up so many things. Um, some of my favorite examples are uh, the WinObjective-C bridge, which is Objective-C running on Windows, also open source. You can use and play with that. Um, other examples I have just named some of them, but um, on Azure, for instance, we're running more and more uh, Linux Docker clusters. We just announced something called, it's not just announced, but um, we just announced the next version of something called the Azure Container Service, where we will increasingly help you run your Docker containers on Azure. But in addition to that, we also just started working directly with uh, famous and really popular platform as a service implementations running on Linux, running on core OS, and make sure that those run well inside Azure. So specifically, if you're looking at something like Deus or Flynn or Doku or any of those popular Docker implementations for cluster management, um, we just run that straight inside Azure. And if you look at the Azure Container Service um, and some of the things we have planned there, um, you will see that we currently contribute a lot to both Mesos as well as Docker. And in fact, for Docker, Microsoft is... So Docker has this little score, this little, this little scoreboard where the top five contributors to the code base are listed. And as of today, the top five of all Microsoft engineers that are essentially paid by us to contribute code to the Docker code base. And obviously, we're not doing that to be super nice, right? This is not us being like, oh, look, we're the nice people. It's, it's, this, is not, this is not goodwill. The idea here is that we do that 
and then eventually, as long as other companies also chip in and other engineers also chip in, um, everybody has to spend less on the bottom line. We can focus on making things a little bit more impressive. Um, so that, that is sort of the very quick overview. Um, the call to action, and that's why I'm trying to talk to as many people as possible, especially in user groups, is how many people in this room have ever submitted a pull request? Three. <laughs> that should be more. It should be dramatically more. Um, I've spoken very bluntly, the .NET open source community right now is, given how many people we have doing open, given how many people we have, given how many people we have doing .NET, and given how many great .NET people we have, that is sort of sad. Um, so, the yes, please. GitHub and use people's libraries, but most don't submit changes back. Yeah. How it, are you going to motivate them to do that anyway? Yeah. That that is sort of the core concept that I'm trying to get out to people. Contributing back to a code base is not something you do because you feel nice or you feel like you want to support something. It's not necessarily a gift you give. Contributing back is your best way of influencing where a project is going especially if you have a stake in it. At the point where you start modifying a code base, it probably means that you do that not because you're bored or because you had nothing else to do, but because you took a major stake in that technology. Right? That is the typical use case. And if you look at some of the companies that I'm working with today, like GitHub or like, like Twitter or Netflix, the reason they open source things is not because they feel like it and they had nothing better to do. It's entirely because they want the community that is consuming those products to have a say in how things are going. And the best way to have a say is to write the code yourself. Um, that is by far the, the best way to do that. And um, yesterday there was a popular post on the interwebs called uh, the ASP.NET Apocalypse is coming. I don't know if any of you are aware, but uh, there's a support deadline for any .NET pre 4.5.2. It's going to approach soon. Right? And at some point, all of this stuff is not going to be supported. But we're still going to have all these open source projects that somebody either touched or didn't touch. And we do have a bunch of .NET projects and a bunch of C-sharp projects that are managed extremely well. Some of them are crazy powerful. My, my favorite would be Squirrel, which is written by a guy called Paul Batts, um, who used to work for GitHub, is now working for Slack. And have any of you played with Visual Studio Code? Just a quick show of hands. OK, that's, that's enough to ask the follow-up question. Um, have you noticed how cool the installation for the first version was? Just a quick example. You download the thing, you double-click it, and the app just opens. Installation already happened in the background. And then as soon as you have the application open, it's going to check if there's an update. And there is an update. It's also just going to update itself also in the background. It's pretty crazy cool. Question. Yes, please. Uh, I've been doing a lot of open source projects. and submit pull request, and one thing I noticed with some of this Microsoft project is that, uh, you mentioned it yourself, you have a lot of backlog of pull requests that's not being dragged into the project. Yeah. And that is uh, something that puts people off. I noticed that some of the projects, when I see there are 75 pull requests there, and I look at the time when they were submitted, and when they see that that's several months ago, ago, then I don't add another pull request to that project. Yeah, that makes sense. Do you remember which project that was? Uh, Nougat. OK, yeah, that seems very fair. Um, so I'm also gonna, I also wanted to talk briefly about what makes a great pull request and what increases the chances of having the pull request merged. Um, ironically, the major one is testing. <laughs> um, but I'm briefly going to finish, finish the other thought. Open source is, is the best way we have to control where a certain technology is going. So at any given time where you and I've been guilty of this myself a few times. Every single time you saw anything that is in theory open source, and then they announce a certain change, and you're like, ugh, that sounds horrible. Uh, just be aware that you had a chance to like, right, become the king of, of said open source project, or to just write your own. Um, I think it's very important that you guys are very aware of of what people, that people are trying to do it, and that you got all your teams to be very active in responding to those pull requests. Yes, if that is absolutely true. I think we're increasingly doing that. Um, yes. It's something we will always have to work on. Um, another major issue we will always have to work on is, and that is sort of, that is sort of what, what also makes this very hard, is that open source is inherently, um, inherently 
sort of not a friendly community, and I think it never has been, which is kind of sad, but that is something we're still seeing today, is that um, inside, open inside the open source world, there's no HR department, right? Nobody really keeps you from being a dick. And I think the most, the most famous example is, is Linus Torvalds, um, the, the guy founding, inventing, and still running the Linux kernel. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever read his emails, but he just demolished his people for like really no good reason, right? Um, and nobody can really do anything about that. You can like stop using Linux, but you know, um, he's still going to be uh, pretty pretty rude. And that is that is a major issue. Um, it, it's gotten sort of better inside the JavaScript world. Um, uh, we had a conference a couple of weeks ago called Open Source Fields, which was specifically about how do we manage to do open source in a way that people don't don't feel um, you know don't feel punished for daring to contribute code. Um, but that certainly is still a major, major issue. As a company, it's easy for us to manage that because we can just tell people to be nice. Um, if you're not nice, you're being fired. That makes it very easy. But for the bigger community, right, and especially if you look at projects that only have Microsoft participation but are not necessarily Microsoft run, that gets increasingly hard. Um, crazy hard, actually. So, But um, yeah, great pull requests. Yes, question. Have you actually ever heard of a success story where you've re-educated a team to um, have more success with people contributing pull requests and people accepting them? Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh my god. Um, let's, let's choose my few favorite ones. Um, I think Azure Web Apps is actually my favorite, um, aka called Kudu, Project Kudu. Um, it's a deployment engine for web apps and pretty much everything that is great about web apps at least started with a pull request. <laughs> Um, which I think is fairly, uh, fairly un probably unfair to say. Um, the web app team is fantastic, but pretty much everything that makes it great eventually started with a pull request, especially around, especially around technologies that are not super close to Microsoft's heart. Um, so when it comes to running, running things like um, Node.js and Azure Web Apps, um, we improved that dramatically over the last three years, and many of those improvements have been straight up pull requests. Um, the other one is that. Uh, contributions don't necessarily are just pull requests. You don't necessarily have to just contribute code. Um, open source also is about figuring out what is actually wrong. Um, so, for instance, on GitHub, GitHub has this interesting thing. Am I daring enough to like touch this computer? Uh, this is. Let's give this a try. Um, so, just to give you a quick example, what's going to happen here? So you may have seen this thing before, um, specifically this green area which counts the contributions. It is very, very important to most, most open source people and open source engineers like myself, which by the way exists at virtually every single company, that an open source contribution doesn't have to be code. What we equally rely on is an issue. Um, if you find a bug, tell me about it. Right? It's, it's very, very important. One of the great examples is, um, actually, yeah, let's just, let's just look at certain things. Um, give me one second to or to duplicate here. Uh, one of the great examples is that we work quite heavily with NPM, um, which is essentially an upgrade tool to update NPM. Uh, just a quick recap to explain the setting here. Um, running Node on Windows was not always as great as it could be for all kinds of reasons, one of them being max path. I'm sure many of you ran into that. And the old version of NPM used to install requirements and dependencies in a nested way which is fantastic because very quickly you max out the path and then everything breaks apart and just all hell breaks loose. It is not just Windows that doesn't necessarily uh, benefit from nested modules. Um, uh, sorry, that does not benefit from nested modules. Linux and Mac OS X, there are also very good reasons not to do that. And in fact, NPM3, which is the latest version of the Packet Manager, does no longer install them in a nested way. Um, here's the downside. Node is such a fragmented community that people for the longest time didn't really agree on how to install and or upgrade NPM. So the default command would be npm install new, new version of npm. If you ever installed Node using the Node installer, right, like giant, that will actually not upgrade NPM, <laughs> which is fantastic. Uh, so that is like one of the typical issues where we're like, ah, fine, let's fix that in like a day, right? So we built this thing. Um, and the interesting piece here is that, for instance, right now, that is something I've been Talking about today, um, if we go to the issues, most of them have been fixed, um, but on like some Azure machines, we still have issues. And most of the time, if you check my comment from I think uh, yesterday, 
we have an issue here. I have no idea what is going on. And every now and then we find a super esoteric issue. And the last major issue we had was that um, on about 0.001% of French users, PowerShell would open up and there would be a female symbol already in the output. French are great lovers. I, I, I have no idea what happened. And I went to the PowerShell team and was like, hey, just so you guys know, every now and then, or like one in 10,000 users, if they happen to be French, STD out is pre filled with a female symbol. What the hell? Um, but every now and then, and, and I'm sure you guys know this, but, but it's not really all that different inside Microsoft or any other company. Engineers sort of like don't know it all. And if you, you know, we don't put bugs in there for fun, so most of the time we don't really know what is actually causing an issue. And some of these people just helping me out, what is actually going wrong is fantastic. So in this case, we have an error. I don't know what's going on. Um, I just published yesterday new code that will probably tell me what is going on, but I still don't know it. So now I totally rely on these people to tell me what is going on. Because if you have an issue that affects um, only a fraction of your users, I can't really, I don't really have the time to talk to a thousand users just in the hopes that sooner or later I find the one where things are breaking, right? So uh, as far as source is concerned, providing issues is at least as useful as providing code. Um, and should you provide bad code, it's definitely more useful. Um, because it is true, providing pull requests is sometimes very, very difficult and it's something that is very hard to get into. And um, in, in, in fact, we're trying to do that now. Mozilla has been doing this for the longest time with Firefox. We're at a point in the open source community where we literally sit people down and make pull requests with them because it is very hard to get into. Um, mostly because open source projects very often have an extremely high buffer code quality, as surprising as that might sound, but there's a certain amount of hybris that comes with you developing something that then thousands of people use. It's very quick. <laughs> Give me any given developer if I tell them, oh, the thing that you just put on GitHub is now used by half a million people, that person will immediately enter douchebag mode when it comes to pull requests, for whatever reason. Um, we haven't really, as an industry, yet figured out why, but it seems to be the case. So. What we do is that uh, we make sure that people are aware that there's a certain workflow to be followed, and I think maybe it's worth if I just quickly put that out here. Um, contributing to open source is fantastic. It's definitely going to help, by the way, in your career if you ever want to work for any major company and or make a lot of money. Um, it's definitely noticeable in what headhunters are going to send you. But there's always the same workflow, and there's always the same issues when pull requests are probably thrown away or very hard to look at. Um, number one is you made a pull request not against an issue, which is where the issue makers come in. Every now and then, and that happens in .NET all the time, is that we get a pull request that just improves things, <laughs> which is we don't even know where to start, right? We don't really know who should look at that pull request. We probably don't want it. So by default, nobody's going to look at it. We're automatically going to close. We'll just say you're developing against not an issue. An issue can be either a request for a new feature, a bug, or anything like that, anything where we agree that this is something we want in the code base. Biggest issue number two is that the pull request combines multiple things at once, right? Like, I fixed this one beautiful bug, but also I changed this other thing, which I think is going to improve .NET fundamentally. Bad idea. Um, and then the third one is as your coverage goes down. Like, um, engineers at Lisa Microsoft, and by the way, I think, I think Google, Apple and various other companies aren't going to mind when I say that for them on, on behalf of them too. Engineers and other companies will be much more likely to look at your code if it's properly unit tested and if it passes tests. If it doesn't pass tests, that's already a very bad sign. Um, but I, I didn't really come here to teach you guys how to do open source. I'm pretty sure you can figure that out without me. You don't really need me for that. What I actually came for is here to kindly ask you, as a .NET, as, as a .NET user group, to please do more open source. Um, because it's probably going to be a lot of fun so far. We've, we've been doing it for a while now. It's been kind of fantastic. Things are going really, really well. It's a lot of fun. Um, but the, the, sorry, almost eight, the bigger reason why I came here is um, to answer any questions you might have around engineering. Obviously, I'm not everywhere in the company, um, but if you want to know about virtually anything, except for why Silverlight not open source, that's a question I got yesterday. Um, please don't ask me why Silverlight is not open source. It's a very complicated why Silverlight is not open source. Oh. Um, is that David Brill? It's already on Twitter. I think I said something along the lines of because we wanted to die, so I can just repeat that. <coughs> I'm already on record. I know, memories in the background. Yes, that's because we wanted to die. Um, but yeah.
Uh, I would Open Q&A. Knowing um, your thoughts on VisualStudio.com and whether they should uh, add features into that that would allow you to have um, more anonymous, or you know, add all the public features in that GitHub has, because obviously it works beautifully inside a company. Mm -hmm. They could add features, you know, that would support sharing code better. Yeah. What do you think of that? So I think I think that's a fantastic question. So um, one important thing I want to point out is that VisualStudio.com, um, as part of the as part of the suite of projects we call we have this Embolar project, Project Monaco, is built by Eric Gamma, um, very nice guy sitting in Switzerland, one of our distinguished engineers. Previously built things like the Java development tools, and I think it's fantastic that that he's spearheading some of these things because I think one of the things he understands very well is that competing with something that already works extremely well is probably a bad idea. And I think especially in the space of open source, right now GitHub is by far, by far, um, so very much the dominant player right now that um, I will still meet a bunch of people who don't really understand the difference between Git and GitHub, um, especially people that I knew. Most people think that's sort of the same thing. Maybe GitHub even came up with Git, right? Um, so I think in the, in the case of Visual Studio Online, um, they do offer private repositories and the whole workflow that you get for free for really small teams, and I think that's awesome, especially for open source teams that maybe want to work in secret a little bit for a while. That's something that GitHub doesn't offer. If you want a private repository on GitHub, you have to pay for that. We offer that for free, together with, by the way, various other tools and projects. And so I think offering it for free is a, is a major step forward, but moving into the direction of also offering pull requests and things like that publicly, um, uh, I can't speak for the Visual Studio team, but um, I haven't seen anything like that. And I don't think we will anytime soon because um, we, for instance, for, those, for all the pieces that Visual Studio Com is consuming that are open source, we manage those on GitHub, um, which should sort of tell you how we feel about that in general. Uh, I, think, I think GitHub is a fantastic tool. Visual Studio Online is a fantastic ALM tool. Um, they sort of do slightly different things. and. When it comes to public pull requests and collaborating in the open, GitHub is sort of the best place to be right now, especially for Microsoft, because um, I think one of the issues I'm still battling as someone who's been, so we founded this team, as I said, about a year ago, and um, I hope that you all, you know, you're at the .NET user group, so clearly you're sort of the spearhead of Microsoft, regional director, you sort of know what's going on, but we still meet so many people that have sort of checked out of Microsoft a few years ago, and um, they have still this default approach that we're sort of running through the industry without looking at anything left and right. And Microsoft Azure clearly is running nothing but Windows. So for 2003, right? That's like what we do. Um, and I don't know what the reason is, but there's a huge portion of the developer community today that at the moment they stopped using Microsoft technologies, they saw all also sort of assumed that we stopped developing things. Um, and this huge dependency web sort of came after. Um, but now that we have Microsoft at a point where Visual Studio installs about 200 open source dependencies, um, it, is, it is for us as a company extremely important that we don't try to enter this market now and be like, oh, by the way, Microsoft has an idea of how, what open source should really look like. Um, right? Because, I mean, Codeplex is essentially, essentially being phased out too. Yeah. Um, I would like to say why I kind of... Um not sure I agree with your position on public pull requests on visualstudio.com because I work with a number of um, SEO guys who just do Google consulting on analytics and stuff and I've really noticed how they really um, are enthusiastic for Bing to be successful mm -hmm. and um, I find that curious because they don't use Bing and they don't get any business you know, for, Google, you know, for Bing ads and etc, a very small amount. And I, I've asked many of them why they care. And they say because they don't fully trust Google. And they want, if Bing wasn't there, then Google would be worse to deal with. And I think it's the same thing. Like right now, Git, GitHub is the golden child. They do a great job. But gee, wouldn't you like them to have a strong competitor? I think they, so two things. A, I think they do, right? There are things like Bitbucket. Um, and there's... Uh, yeah, that's the thing. I'm not sure that we should be it, right? We, we sort of have to pick our battles, and I don't think, I don't think Microsoft is the one that should tell people right now how to do open source. Um, that does not necessarily seem like the right approach. 
um, especially considering that the enterprise market and the way enterprise teams collaborate together is fundamentally different from the way dispersed and highly diverse teams collaborate together. And I think GitHub, by the way, is fantastic, outstanding if you have a team that is across the world, you don't really know all these people, at best you maybe have a Skype chat with them, whereas Visual Studio um, is really for mission-critical ALM software, right, where m at least everybody knows each other in the room. Um, so if you... I would, for instance, not like to build a product like Windows on GitHub. I don't think that's going to be fun, right? I certainly wouldn't do it. I'm pretty sure that somebody at GitHub would be like, ah, actually, you can, but ah, right? And it's sort of about what is the right tool to build something. Um, to, make, to make this maybe a little bit more obvious, Subversion, the version control system, is developed in Git. Not because they think Git is better, but because they're saying, Subversion might be a great tool for gigantic software projects, but Subversion isn't one, so we're using Git for that. Um, and in the same way, we think that Visual Studio Online is fantastic for certain enterprise scenarios and certain, certain development scenarios, but when it comes to open source, adding features that not necessarily make a product better. Right. Uh, I think you're a little tainted because you're thinking of 35-year-olds plus who think that way about Microsoft. But there's a whole young generation, you know, 15 to 20 year olds, who think Microsoft's cool with HoloLens, and they're a different. <laughs> they, they have a different, you know, they have a different um, background. It's uh, possible. Yeah. Frankly, I th think you underestimate Visual Studio Online a little bit, because the newest version of Visual Studio Online and Visual Studio can work directly with GitHub. Yeah. And the way we have been using it is for two purposes: we can have a GitHub repository, and we do the build using Visual Studio Online. That's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. The other thing we're doing is uh, we can start off an open source project. We put that up on Visual Studio Online because we don't want anyone to see. Then, since Visual Studio supports multiple remote repositories, we push up to GitHub when we feel that's due time to do that. Yeah, that, that that's exactly what I meant by offering these private services for free, which we do for open source teams too. Exactly. Right? And you yeah. can have both at the same time. And you can continue that way doing something in private and just push both directions as you feel. Then yeah. you can say, that, okay, now we're working on something we want to keep a little bit secret. Have it there. Have all the bills there. Yeah, I, I hope I made myself clear when I said that that is exactly what we want to do. Okay, cool. Right? Thanks. Um, that, is, that is why there's a free version of Visual Studio Online, which is public, where everybody can do those things. But um, I, I, do think, I do think it is important for us right now, at least speaking on behalf of open source engineering at Microsoft, our goal really is to collaborate and not to compete. Um, that, is, that is the important piece, right? So we, work, we try to work together with GitHub in as many products as possible. If you install Visual Studio 2015, minus one little hiccup that we totally fixed now. Um, we have a GitHub extension in Visual Studio. Visual Studio Online has, has GitHub inclusions. Azure works extremely well with GitHub today. Um, and we sort of move that development forward. We ourselves move more and more stuff into GitHub. You can run your own version of GitHub if you feel like it on Azure. So it's really about collaboration and not com competition. We, of course, compete with many companies and many, many things. But um, specifically, when you think about the world of GitHub, just as one example, um, um, you can, it is very visible how we feel about that, the way we treat CodePlex today. Because CodePlex, in many ways, I think, was born with the same ideas as GitHub. But we just have to accept that if we put something on CodePlex, the amount of people that are going to see it and are going to be able to collaborate on that dramatically smaller than on GitHub. And if our goal is to um, make our technologies as good as possible, at, at the end of the day, for the developer, and if we want to serve that goal by making it open and available to as many collaborators as possible, we have to go where developers are. That's what we have to do. Yeah, code, code box is uh, finished. You know, they're not investing in that anymore. Yeah. Um, I I ha I'm coming back to the question of the open sourcing of the .NET framework and, and stuff. Um, I happen to have looked at, um, I think, um, MS Core Lib or something like that. Yeah. Um, and I noticed that it's it was um, uh, it had something to the effect. I mean, a notice or whatever message saying um, you can't really build this because it's like it's not got the resource files or blah blah whatever. You can't really build this on your, and I obviously tried it, it couldn't be done. Yeah. And st stuff like symbols, you have to define them, you have to do something or the other. Yeah. Um, and that got me thinking, like, is it really a showcase kind of a situation where you have just released it for the showcase aspect? Or is it like, 
does it have any use right now? Because if you have, if you're expecting contributions, I mean, it almost seemed like a dump of of the of the of the source. Yeah, and we, we definitely guilty of that every now and then. So um, it's, um, I mean, I'm not sure what the philosophy is. Is it like, uh, and how? What kind of stuff have you got uh, contributed to to that kind of a project? Um, I might be wrong. Uh, so no, you're totally sorry right. Sorry about that. You're absolutely um, right. Um, um, because I, I by no means uh, am. Anyway, yeah, sorry, uh, you could... No, you're totally, you're totally right, F for the following reasons. Number one is whether or not you can actually build it. If you couldn't, we sort of failed, right? That's, that's the idea here. Number two is that, um, and that is also what we do inside the company. So I, I give very similar talks, by the way, inside the company all the time. Um, in fact, this, is, this used to be an internal talk. Um, if you worked at Microsoft for 20, 20 years and all you were ever used to is that everybody who will ever touch the code has access to a gigantic build pipeline. If you think about something like um, .NET is a great example, but for instance, Bing for the longest time used to be a monorepo. So the whole thing was like one repository and you would clone it and then you would like go on vacation for a week, right? Because that is how long that would take. Um, so the expect for the longest time, and we still have a lot of legacy where we just assume that people have all the time we need to do certain tasks was very prevalent. And then in addition to that, if you didn't work in open source for the longest time, um, you're, not really, you're not necessarily used to how things work. So at the point where Satya took over the company, having run Azure before, and open source suddenly became this very popular thing inside the company, which was mostly led by legal, um, what, what happened then is that we had a bunch of people who always really wanted to do open source, but didn't really know how, which um, I can't really judge them for it, but what you probably encountered is someone who said, uh, well, let's at least do the, right, the best thing we can do right now, which is just to open source the code itself. And then let's worry about making the collaboration aspect work later. Um, and, and you will probably, in those 1,100 and something repositories, you will probably still find every now and then one where it's not super obvious how to collaborate on it. My, my example is MS Build. Um, my team has, we, we snatched three engineers from MS Build. Um, I don't know if you ever looked at MS Build, but it's like essentially one file. Like, <laughs> condense it, it's one file with thousands of lines, all of them super esoteric. Unless you're paid to study this thing for half a year, I don't think anybody's going to look at it anytime soon. Um, it is cool that we open sourced it, so people can at least look at it. And if somebody is paid to do it at over, you know, over Xamarin or over at Mono Directly or at Unity, that is already going to be great, but really to truly embrace it, we need to make it as easy as possible for other engineers to have a say and take a look. Um, so, so I think this is a great example. Um, MS Colab specifically is um, pretty tough. <laughs> it's uh, one of those pieces where you rip them out. You have like all these loose ends where you rip things apart. Um, and there's inside the company, there's this huge dependency web where every now and then you want to open source this one piece, but then you grab it and you realize by the roots hang like Azure and Windows over there and you need all these pieces. But it's a great question and uh, the answer is like not that great. I've um, just got a, a question on, obviously, you're aware of, I mean, across a lot of open source projects, how do you, sort of when you, you, a new one comes on the radar, mm -hmm. how do you kind of get involved in that to sort of understand how to, to build it? Because there's a difference between using, say, a library as an outfacing person as opposed to contributing to the code or looking through the code. What, what steps do you take to sort of get across it quicker? Because obviously, an example would be is I looked at... Um, Glimpse. Mm -hmm. I was looking at contributing to the newer version of that because they're re rewriting it for Vnext, mm -hmm. and I thought, oh, this is a great time probably to get in because they're rewriting it. Um, and I pulled down the code, compile, won't compile. Hmm. Okay. Oh yeah, we're working on beta eight, and you're on beta six. Okay, so you do the latest up, so you, you go through from that. Is it just a matter of reading the code? Is it matter of go back through the commit history? Is it just scraping through documents? What's the best way to sort of I get think, up to speed? I think that's I think that's a fantastic question. Um, so here's how I do it. I can't say that that's the universal truth, but here's how I do it. And we obviously contribute to various projects at any given time. That is what we do. So I have to do this all the time. Um, number one is, no, let me start here. About half the responsibility lies with the project itself. And I'm just going to mention some of these things. You can't change them as someone who wants to get into it, but it's perfect if they are there. Number one is, and that I think is getting increasingly popular, is that we mark issues as beginner friendly. TypeScript is doing that, Ghost is doing that, which is a... You mark issues as beginner friendly. Mm -hmm. So every now and then you find an issue where you now it's more like elbow grease and less coming up with a great solution that plays well with the future plans. 
Um, typical, te typical things are, we wrote this thing, and let's be honest, the unit tests kind of suck. Can somebody please write a unit test that actually captures what this method is doing, right? Um, mocking is another great example. So beginner issues are fantastic. So what do you do if beginner issues aren't there, right? Um, at the end of the day, most projects today at least have a contributing guide. And I think GitHub is now doing a fairly good job of sh st stuffing that into your face, which ideally should take care of how do I get my development environment set up? Um, if I have to use Vagrant or something like that, what, what do I have to do? And how do I actually get going? And then the fourth step is, um, uh, for me at least, trying to write new unit tests or trying to fix unit tests or trying to break unit tests and see how the code works together, um, which is, I think, a popular way of learning code in general, but unit tests are a fantastic way of figuring out how code works. And then here's where things get a little bit messy. Um, in my case, I'm working on like another project like Electron Visual Studio Code where I know I need to fix something. If I'm doing something for fun, I'm doing open source contributions for fun, um, I think the most contributions I did to date were, were on Ghost, which is this giant blogging platform. I usually focus on the stuff that um, I'm slightly excited by, right? Hope to find issues that are sort of related, um, and then pick the one that seems the easiest. Try to do that and then get feedback early and quickly. Um, and here's one thing that is sometimes a little bit easier if you're, if you're working in a friendly open source community than in a non-friendly open source community, but many of them are very excited to help people out. And I, for instance, have totally held Skype chats with people that just wanted to contribute and had like a couple of questions about the code base, which makes things dramatically easier. So a um, good example is the Azure Storage Explorer. Um, one of the contributions came from a totally other side of the company. Um, there's, something, there's something called Mooncake, which is the Chinese version of Azure. It's behind the firewall. It looks like Azure, behaves like Azure, but for all kinds of legal reasons, and I'm, I hope you're happy to hear this, but it's not really the same project and not really the same product, right? There's the firewall is not only a legal one, it's also a very technical one. Um, so the Azure Storage Explorer, oops, doesn't really work with Mooncake, um, and somebody wanted to fix that. So I was, more, I was A, delighted that somebody figured that out, but B, also delighted that somebody wanted to help me, and those Skype chats are are tremendously useful, and I'm, I'm constantly on the receiving end of those. Um, so in the case of, has anybody ever worked with Ember or jQuery? Let's start with jQuery. jQuery, okay, yeah. So, um, or Promises. JavaScript prom it doesn't matter, it's a JavaScript thing, don't worry about it, you're the user group. Anyway, there's a few very important people inside the JavaScript community, um, and there's like only a handful of people who came up with all the things, like jQuery, Ember, Promises, uh, it's sort of like a very small group, and um, uh, I, every now and then there's like one guy who I'm going to not name because I don't think that would be fair, but every now and then he jumps on a call with me and explains like his genius to me, which is fantastic, right? And that sort of helps me along. Um, so that's, that's how I do it. Uh, that's how I do it. <laughs> All right, Felix, I'm going to ask you a question about um, DevOps, pretty important inside Microsoft. Okay. Do you have any uh, best practices you've come across in that field, <laughs> that area? <laughs> so uh, DevOps, what's up with that? So um, number one, I think DevOps is a very, very wide field. Very wide. So I'm very quickly going to cut it down just for me, okay? Uh, and you're going to like this, but I'm going to leave ALM for a moment completely outside. Um, so let's not worry about a moment how you build an application in a way that you can release quickly and release often, right? Let's just assume you already know how to release quickly and release often. The next step then is that you come up with a solution that is highly maintainable and highly deployable and doesn't break and ideally doesn't page you ever. Um, anybody here user of PagerDuty? No? It's, it's like one service which is used to page Microsoft, Apple, Google, I live in San Francisco and obviously the whole city is full with engineers and all of, all of us have like the same dumb pager duty app which keeps waking us all at night. Pager duty. Um, it's just a pager app. If you remember the good old pager days, but for instance, um, my girlfriend works at Twitter and if Twitter goes down, I have for whatever reason have to wake up, which makes no sense to me at all, but right? So um, the reason I'm bringing this up is that the DevOps piece at least I think where most of the innovation is happening today is really focusing on let's remove the amount of times people are being woken up at night because your stuff breaks. Um, I think that's the major piece. And what we essentially are moving towards is to make scheduling really, really great. 
the scheduling of tasks. So if you think about if you think about a cluster and you think about an infrastructure and you want to make sure that that infrastructure is used as effectively as possible, at Microsoft we have something called the service fabric, which makes it, at least as a consumer for us, very easy, but we also have thousands of people. No, that's not true. We have a certain number of people um, working on the service fabric, which essentially makes sure that if your VM on Azure doesn't really do anything right now, that there is not an actual chip that also doesn't do anything, um, which is really called scheduling. And I think. Maybe Twitter is a great example because they just released, not just, but they um, are using, um, using a scheduler called Aurora, um, which organizes their tasks because at the end of the day, once you break up applications into tasks, you usually find long-running tasks and short-running tasks. Some example would be a web server. It's a task that usually just runs forever. Um, then you have every now and then you have backups. Um, you have certain cron jobs, certain tasks that run every now and then. In the Microsoft world today, if you run the small version of Azure Web Apps, we just call those web jobs. Right, so um, you essentially have tasks, and then the question becomes: How do we effectively manage and schedule tasks? How do we make sure that you can use your hardware as effectively as possible without breaking things? And um, right now, at least as far as Microsoft is concerned, I'm just going to throw out a few names of stuff we really like. Um, obviously, we like Docker. I think that's something you've already seen, right? Docker, sort of the way how we think about containerization in the future. Um, and then a bunch of stuff we really like would be Deus. That's at least something we like very, very well. Um, it's a small platform as a service that you can run yourself. It's pretty fantastic. Um, it uses Docker images. It essentially is an open source version of Heroku. Um, sorry to Heroku, but Deus is sort of amazing. Um, does the whole 12-factor thing where you can very quickly roll back all by itself. Um, and then as far as scheduling is concerned, we currently really like Mesos. And we really like Mesos and Mesosphere. Um, and there will probably be a lot more announcements in the future, but Mesos and Docker are sort of how we currently think um, containers are going to be really, really cool and really, really useful, especially, especially if you want to do resource management yourself effectively, right? Because if you have a VM running and you have a bunch of tasks, how do you orchestrate a way in which um, you don't pay more. And I think Twitter is a great example. I'm going to mention what that means in practice at Twitter. Twitter engineers have, in theory, unlimited resources. So they're experimenting with applications. They can deploy those as much as they want. But if the actual production environment needs more resources and needs to scale up, that is managed automatically. Right? So as an engineer, I can do like my experimental stuff. But if the production environment needs more resources, the production environment is intelligent enough to realize that it needs more resources and to automatically increase its scale, and by increasing its scale, to also automatically knock out some of those experiments. Right? And that, I think, is, is pretty amazing. Um, which, by the way, is something we also have inside the company. We have an internal version of Azure where I can pretty much play around as much as I want to, but I have no guarantee that if, for whatever reason, Bing is on fire tomorrow, that my stuff is still going to be there. Uh, and that is something we're trying to, I think as an industry, trying to put to a lower, lower scale, where DevOps is more and more focused towards the development piece, and we sort of move to a way where maybe ops will eventually not go away, but be something we can maybe do without waking people up at night. Very general answer to a very general question. All right. Uh, I think I'll ask the last question then, since nobody else wants to. <laughs> yeah, it's also getting late, right? Um, Windows Phone uh, 10. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to know your thoughts on that, because it uh, obviously the big problem is apps, and now you can get uh, all the Android apps, but you, know, you kind of have to recompile them to get the best yeah. experience. That can, can, is that going to save Windows Phone, or is it finished? <laughs> Oh my God. So I'm totally on the clock right now, um, which I think we're certainly trying, right? So the, the number one thing I want to put out there is that nobody's giving up on Windows Phone. And one major difference between, between Windows Phone 10, or Windows Mobile 10, as we call it today, and Windows Phone, at least the previous versions, is um, the Venn diagram on the API layer. So what we used to have, Windows Phone, should have, should have like a whiteboard or something, but that doesn't work online anyway. What we used to have was two circles that just intersected in the middle. So you had a bunch of APIs here and a bunch of APIs there, and sometimes those work together. And I don't know if any of you, for instance, saw the, um, um, there's a little robot called Sphero 
Uh, it's like this remote-controlled robot, and they have a Star Wars version right now, which is very cool. Um, it's like this little ball, with, like, you can control it from your phone. And um, I wrote the Windows Bluetooth stack for that thing. And while doing that, even as a Microsoft engineer, you keep asking yourself, why do we have three APIs for Bluetooth again? That doesn't seem smart. Like, why? It's a little bit confusing, right? Especially for an application that is supposed to run on both Windows desktop as well as Windows Phone at this time. Um, and Windows Mobile 10, and I know that we gave like various marketing versions of that pitch over and over again, but for real, you guys, it's not true. Um, the Venn diagram is that we have Windows as a big brother, one giant circle, and then, and then Windows Mobile is just a smaller circle, but it's inside. There's 100% overlap. There's absolutely nothing in Windows Mobile that is not on Windows on the API layer. And um, in combination with uh, Windows Objective-C and in combination with the, uh, with the Android runtime and in combination with the stuff we're doing with, with web apps, I certainly hope that that is going to be a giant push. I do have to say that I personally believe that it's, as somebody who develops for both iOS and Android, it is by far the most convenient development environment that, that we have in the mobile world today. However, that also sadly has been true before, right? So um, I'm, personally, I'm personally not sure if that is going to be enough. I certainly hope so. Um, the one downside I see is, and I don't know if that's just me drinking the Kool-Aid, but I always thought the Visual Studio was sort of the best. Has anybody ever opened up Android Studio? Do that every now and then. Just do it, just for fun. Download Android Studio, open it up, build anything, and uh, just see what happens. And then go back to Visual Studio. You're going to feel like it's, it's like a vacation, really. Um, it's sort of fantastic. Uh, so, so long story short, I think Windows Phone always had the best development experience. Uh, the, the question is, are our, our business development teams, are they capable of turning that ease and convenience and development over into, um, over into actual apps? Because as we all know, what at the end of the day makes or breaks a platform is the quality of the best applications. And if there's one thing I've seen by talking to a bunch of companies today is that the people who build those top quality applications do not care about how easy things are. And if they are the worst, they will still go with it. A um, great example, for instance, is that uh, we announced all those Android tools. And I, I sort of went to a bunch of uh, Droid cons talking to people about how we announced all these Android tools. Um, and Visual Studio is really good at C++. And apparently, 44 of the top 50 Android apps are entirely written in C++. So I don't know if any of you ever tried to write a messaging app, like Facebook Messenger in C++, but it is, you could sort of start at nothing, right? Like, first, you implement HTTP, right? It's like sort of at that level. Um, you don't even think about REST. Like, first, let's think about what the TCP IP stack looks like. Um, so yeah, I, I, think, I think we have a bunch of innovation in the platform itself for users. Um, however, users have always been very, very happy with Windows Phone. W what is sort of the missing piece and what we're trying to do with just gigantic amounts of convenience, right? Basically, just like press this button, your app is going to work, um, is that we have to make sure the developers take their apps over. Yeah, your answer is missing the Xamarin story. Uh, I think Xamarin is great, um, but Xamarin sort of has to sell on its own, right? And um, I think Xamarin is... You're very dependent on Xamarin now. How so? Well, it, you don't own Xamarin. Mm -hmm. Xamarin are their own beast, and developers uh, need Visual Studio with Xamarin. And the basic version that comes with Visual Studio 2015 isn't good enough. They need to get the yeah. real thing. And Xamarin's pricing model isn't like Microsoft's. And Xamarin's, you know, there's there's a lot of in dealing with Xamarin is not like dealing with, you know, friendly Microsoft people. I know they're fairly expensive. So. Uh, three, three points to that, though. Number one is Xamarin is amazing. I actually think it's worth the money. However, I think it's most amazing to people who already know .NET, are familiar with .NET, and like C Sharp. That community has traditionally not been the one that didn't want to publish to Windows Phone or Windows Mobile. So should we ever reach a point where Xamarin convinces people to use Xamarin not to build cross-platform apps that also run on iOS, but should we get a point where Xamarin convinces iOS developers that they should ditch all this Apple stuff, use C Sharp to build Apple apps that, by the way, maybe if you write the right code, also run on Windows. That would be awesome. That would be awesome because that will make our life very easy. However, that's not really where we are right now, sadly. Um, but also, I think Xamarin is sort of getting like, given that Xamarin is essentially just a really pretty UI on top of Cecile, that's unfair. It's way more. But given that they 
essentially just consume mono and that we just gave mono this gigantic patent-sized gift. I think the Xamarin is in a pretty good position right now. Awesome. Yeah. And with that, the pieces have arrived. And thank Perfect. you very much, Felix. Sure.